Greetings, folks, and welcome to our second little talk on the Pre-Raphaelite movement. What I think I'd like to do today is just take a look at some images of the Lady of Shalott, which, as I mentioned in a previous talk, is not actually a Pre-Raphaelite poem, but that did inspire a lot of wonderful work, both among the Pre-Raphaelites and afterwards. And by the way, if you've never listened to Lorena McKennett's musical rendition of the poem, you are really missing something. I think I'll post a link. In any case, what I think I'm going to do now is just go through uh, an abbreviated version of a slideshow that I do when I teach the Lady of Shalott and take a look at some of the wonderful paintings that have come out of that poem. Again, specifically confining myself to the Paraphialite movement. The paintings are in narrative order, not chronological order. And to the best of my ability, I've paired them with passages from the scenes that the painters are trying to depict. I'll try not to get too hung up on any of them because I know it would be easy to get lost and spend an entire day just losing myself in this wonderful artwork, which, as you all know by now, is my favorite school of painting. So instead of a deep analysis, what I'm hoping to do is just throw out some ideas about these paintings, and then maybe have the slideshow open and available during our tutorial on Friday in case the conversation looks like it wants to tend in that direction. For now, though, if you haven't read The Lady of Shalott, I strongly suggest that you do. It's a wonderful poem. And actually, rather than just reading it, if you like, give a listen to McKennett's musical rendition of it. Because between saying that I was going to post a link and uttering this sentence, I have actually gone onto YouTube and found a link and posted it to Moodle. When you've done one of those two things, come on back and we'll immerse ourselves in some wonderful visual art. The first piece I'd like to look at is actually the last one to be painted. This is the third of John William Waterhouse's three depictions of the Lady of Shalott, painted in 1915, so certainly well after the Victorian period, but still very much a Pre-Raphaelite painting. This one catches the lady just sitting up from her loom and about to look out the window down to Camelot, which you can see depicted in the background. Her body language here is very telling, isn't it? The way she's holding her arms, the way she's holding her hands, you can tell that she's aching in her upper back, in her shoulders, from bending over the loom at which she's been working. So, though this is in a sort of a fantastic literary setting, the, the physical realism is very striking. And the situation of an actual person an actual woman bending over a loom for hours and hours a day is, I think, caught in the obvious pain that she's trying to massage out of her own shoulders. But here, though, I think it's maybe worth talking about what the loom is, what the loom does in the poem, and what its relationship is to the lady's identity and to feminine identity as often constructed in Western discourse. That is, weaving is a quintessential woman's art in Western culture, Western mythology, Western language even. This is the art associated, for example, with the machinations of Athena in the Odyssey, and as well with Penelope in the Odyssey, weaving both a shroud and a scheme simultaneously. And even in language, if we take a look at the English word woman, which in Old English is Weefman, from the Proto-Germanic Weban, which is of uncertain origin going, be going beyond that, I have read at least reasonable speculation that Weban is related to the Proto-Germanic word for weaving, or rather to weave, which is Weben, related also to words for web, for instance. That is, the word woman, a contraction of weefman, may very well literally mean weaving person, with man, of course, being person. That is, the word woman may, and I have to underline the word may, I'm not making a positive assertion here, may actually, as a contraction perhaps of weban or weban, or sorry, as a compound rather, 
may actually mean something like weaving person. And it's not uncommon to have women defined in such relative terms. Relative, that is, to the interest that they serve or, or the service that they provide. I'm thinking of Korean right now, where the word for wife is chip saram. Saram being the word for person and chip being the word for house. So your wife is your house person. But to get back to the painting, one of the features of weaving, of course, is that it's an indoor activity. And the construction of a feminine identity as a person weaving is necessarily a construction of an identity that is, or rather that has, walls around it. And in the poem, the lady is explicitly enclosed, isn't she? While she weaves the sights that she sees out the window, she's constrained from looking out the window directly even, but rather has to view it through a mirror on the opposite wall, which of course on the one hand provides an accurate representation, but on the other hand a completely inverse representation. So while she's producing art, and quintessentially feminine art, again given the cultural history of weaving and women, is doing so in a way that keeps her completely shut out of the world of action by being completely shut in. The, the inside area is, and this is something that the Victorians really emphasized, a feminine space. She is, well, the term is she is the embowered woman. The bower being uh, a, an indoor space associated with rest and eroticism and presided over by a woman, by the feminine, whereas the outside, the world out there, is the world of masculine activity. This, by the way, was part of the discourse of empire, and I think in a very real way continues to be the discourse of empire. If we take a look at the way certain currents in even contemporary American culture continue to function. But as I keep having to say, to get back to the poem, and to get back to the picture, this is the moment when she sits up from her weaving, from her making art of what she sees only indirectly, and is lured to looking out at the actual world and the actual political and social center of the world, Camelot, visible from her window, the world of social engagement, of, of public activity, and being lured there by the sound she hears coming in her window, the sound, of course, being the voice of Lancelot singing and awakening her own erotic nature. And she, of course, is immediately, and as we see, tragically, smitten. The poem, by the way, is based on an episode in Mallory, in which the Lady of Shalott, she actually is given a name in Mallory. In Tennyson, she doesn't even have that much. She's just the lady. But in Mallory, she's the lady of Ascalot, not a lot. And she has a history going back in the French Romance tradition. So if you want to trace her literary history, that's the way you would want to go about it. Oh, and her name, by the way, is Elaine. But we see her here. I keep having to drag myself back to the specific thing. I'm sorry. We see her here just on the point of embracing on the one hand, the reality denied her, and on the other hand, the curse, whose outcome she doesn't know, both of which are bound up intimately with turning her energy outside to the world of actual human engagement, rather than the isolated existence that she's been living, an existence, as she says, of shadows, of which she is half sick. And that line, half sick, is wonderful, isn't it? Because it means she's also half not sick. She's conflicted. She's just at that moment of, of, of conflict, of transition, torn between these two worlds. And on that topic of the embowered woman and the positioning of her in her enclosure as an erotic sort of space, an erotic configuration, I think it might be worthwhile looking at Maityard's 1913 depiction of the poem, set at about the same time as the Waterhouse depiction that we just looked at. Here, though, the palette is quite different, isn't it? The, the purples and the blues, the soft hues, it's 
honestly a palette that I would immerse myself in forever and probably be quite happy. But at the same time, the lady herself is in an interesting position, isn't she? She's reclining at the moment of decision and her eyes are closed, but her face is directed toward the mirror where we actually see a couple in the same hues that infuse the room in which she finds herself. But here we see the couple is outside, engaging in life. They're, they're with each other. They're not alone. Her own aloneness is really highlighted in that image in the mirror, isn't it? The solitude of the embowered woman is really kind of tragically in front of us here. And yet at the same time, her reclining position and her exposed throat make her also the object of an erotic gaze. And this is how, as I said, that figure functioned in Victorian society. This is an image, an idealized image of the feminine that infused the, the hyper-masculine discourse of empire. This was the thing, the scenario, the setting toward which men could turn their hearts and did turn their hearts while they were out in the world engaging the dirty nitty gritties of, of public life from which women were in Victorian society more excluded than they had been in, for example, the previous century. That is, I think both Tennyson and, and Mayard are aware of the conflicts involved in this image, the, the idealization of it on the one hand and the constraining or confining nature of it on the other. And I think that tension is really apparent in, in the common palette between the room itself and the couple living their life that she can only at this moment see in the mirror and a life that is denied her, it turns out. But let's move forward and in moving forward also move back. Egley's 1858 Lady of Shalott catches the lady just at the moment when she is looking down to Camelot. The moment, that is, when she embraces or accepts or brings upon herself the curse of looking out of her confined and confining existence into the broader world of active engagement rather than mere reflection. And this takes us back towards the very beginning of the Paraphaelite movement as well. This is a very early painting as far as this movement's concerned. And here as elsewhere, I'd like to look at both the palette and the details of the scene. This is a very golden image, isn't it? Amber, gold, yellow. This is the dominant shade, the dominant hue, rather. And it infuses both the space itself and the being of the lady, the depiction of the lady in her clothes, in her skin, in her hair. She is sort of of a piece with the scene. And at this point, as I said, she is looking down to Camelot. She has stood up and walked away from the loom. But we can also see where the loom is and where she no longer stares, the mirror with Lancelot. And that image of Lancelot with the red draped over his horse. Red, of course, evoking notions of, of passion and also of action. This shows us as well that when she's looking down, when she's looking out, what she is seeing is Lancelot. What she is seeing is what we are seeing in the mirror. What meets our eyes is also what meets her eyes, even though what actually meets her eyes is outside the frame. That is, this is another view of the moment of her awakening, the moment when she realizes she can no longer stay enclosed, no matter what may happen to her afterwards. Another reason I bring up the palette, another reason I bring up the, the pervading hue in the space is that the time of day is ambiguous, isn't it? This could be early morning, but it could also be early evening. And the sky doesn't give us any clue. The sky is just a blank and maybe a welcome blank because it gives our eyes a place to rest because the rest of the frame is, is so full. I tend to see this as a late afternoon, early evening time frame, but I don't know. One thing I do know, however, is that I now have to tell you a very sad story. This picture, this sketch, is done by Elizabeth Siddall. 
in 1853, titled, of course, The Lady of Shalott, and set at the moment when, as we can see, the loom self-destructs and the mirror cracks as the lady looks out the window. But there's a lot going on here that isn't going on in any of the other depictions that we've looked at so far or that we will be looking at. And this is the only one, at least that I'm aware of from the time, produced by a woman artist. Siddal herself was a model who sat for many of the Pre-Raphaelite painters, including Rossetti, with whom she became involved and ultimately whom she married, and with whom she had one stillborn daughter. Siddal was from a working-class family. Rossetti's family was not, and he was hesitant to marry her because, arguably, of fear of his family's disapproval, which was a very genuine fear on his part, but also perhaps, and this is not an unreasonable speculation, that he ultimately had his eye out for another muse because she did serve as his muse for a long time. After they became involved, she sat for no one but him. And he produced, if you include sketches, over a thousand works that feature Elizabeth. But at the same time, she was in poor health and in rapidly declining health towards, uh, towards later life. She perhaps had tuberculosis, although that's not certain, and her various illnesses did conspire to wind up with her being addicted to laudanum. Her death in 1862, while not ruled a suicide, very well may have been. It's rumored that when Rossetti came home from his teaching job, he found her unconscious, was unable to rouse her, but also found a note pinned to her breast saying, take care of Henry. Henry was her brother, of whom we know relatively little, but who may have been mentally incapacitated in some way. But the note, if it existed, doesn't survive, so there remains a great deal of speculation or mystery around what end Elizabeth Siddall came to. In terms of her work as a model, the best known picture for which she sat was Malay's Ophelia which you can find easily enough online, and I may put up a link to it on our page. And in fact, as sitting for this picture wasn't really sitting, but rather lying submerged in water for a long time, this is the image of Ophelia drowned in the river, the experience of, of, of that prolonged submersion seems to have actually precipitated much of her illness. But another reason why I bring this up is that the lady here, is not depicted as an object of an erotic gaze, as she is in so many other paintings and so many other sketches and drawings, and as she is arguably in the poem itself. The setting here is stark, it's sparse. There is no comfort in the room at all. Even the cupboard is bare, we see in the lower right-hand corner, and the image of Lancelot in the mirror that image that draws her out of her isolation into simultaneously real life and real death is itself a shadow. It's worth noting as well, and I think there is an interesting religious discourse going on here, that there is a cross between her and the window. There's a cross between her and the outside. She's looking through. That is her gaze. Her perception of the world is mediated by this layer of iconography that paints its own color on everything she sees. Christianity, of course, the Bible, of course, being a discourse that unambiguously subordinates women to men and that argues in places, both Old and New Testament, for the silence of women among men. I'm thinking of Paul's admonition, you shall not suffer a woman to teach. That is, this is a sketch done not by a man idealizing the embowered woman, but rather by a woman who fucking lived it. This is an inside picture of the scenario that so many of the men of the period idealized both verbally and visually. And I think it's, it's a wonderful unveiling of the situation of the woman herself, stripped of the idealizing or idealization imposed 
and even glorified by so much of the discourse of the time. That is, I think in this sketch, more than really in any of the paintings that we're actually looking at, we actually get a look inside the lady's psyche and see what it's like to be a woman constrained in this way at this time. And this is not a life I would wish on anyone. Moving forward in both narrative and time, we come to this wonderful depiction by William Holman Hunt. This one, like the Siddall picture that we were just discussing, catches the lady at exactly the moment when the loom flies to pieces. But it's, of course, a very different image than the one Siddall gives us, isn't it? And honestly, of all of the images of Lady of Shalott that I've encountered at least, this one is probably the most dynamic. The lady is standing in the middle of the loom here. It's a round loom rather than the tabletop ones that the other images that we've looked at depict. And as, as the loom flies apart, her hair is also flying wild. So there's a consonance between the tapestry and her hair. She's also bound up in the threads themselves, isn't she? If you take a look, especially at her lower body, the, the, the threads are wrapped around her legs. So these are holding her. It's a wonderful poetic detail, of course, that's not in the poem, but that captures something that is true to the poem. And it may be worth noticing here as well that the image of Lancelot glimpsed out the window is both quite small, which is fine, linear perspective and all, but also kind of washed out. The intense color is reserved for the interior of the chamber. And to return to her wild hair, which is the most striking part of this image, you kind of have to wonder what that's doing, don't you? On the one hand, it looks like it may just simply be caught in the act of a very quick turn. This is at least a decent physical explanation of it, but also with it up there like a cloud, a dark cloud over her, having come loose, obviously, from its previous controlled state. There's this sense that as she looks out toward Lancelot or is drawn to Lancelot, who's just outside the window, there is this coming apart of the control, the order that's defined her existence up until this point. And in that sense, I think the choice of, of dark hair, so the dark cloud over her, really does seem to unite her fate and her physicality in ways that I find, or in a way that I find particularly compelling. I keep using that word. It does mean what I think it means. But as long as we're speaking of entanglement, why don't we also take a look at this second Lady of Shalott by Waterhouse, this one done in 1894. And here as well, we can see that the thread is wrapped around her leg. She's tangled up in the tapestry here as well. This one predates the Holman Hunt image by a few years. And the inextricability here of, of the lady and the tapestry are, I think, maybe even a little more clearly illustrated than in the Holman Hunt image because there's more focus actually drawn to them. Other details that I think are worth mentioning in this picture are, well, most importantly, I think most strikingly, her gaze. She's looking right out of the frame at you. But this is also the moment when she looks out at Lancelot and the mirror is directly behind her, which means you are in the Lancelot position. This is worth thinking about. Because, of course, her life has been cloistered to this point, hasn't it? And presumably, the viewer is not living a cloistered life. So whatever it is that Lancelot embodies in this interpretation of the poem, it's implicitly also present in the viewer. And this makes the viewer, on the one hand, kind of interestingly, the object of the gaze of the lady rather than the lady being the object of the gaze of the viewer. I think that's very cool. This empowers the lady in some interesting ways, doesn't it? Even though she's wrapped up, tangled up in, in her weaving. But there's also a sense, therefore, insofar as Lancelot is the cause of the lady's undoing, that if the viewer is in the Lancelot position, the viewer bears some of the blame, even if unintentional. 
That is, maybe there's a, a suggestion here that the world outside the painting is the thing that is beckoning the embowered lady. And the painting itself becomes her enclosing location from which she is trying to escape. But of course, as we see later, to her own demise. On the other hand, though, another way of looking at the eye contact in this image is it's almost as if, and I know this isn't part of the poem, it's just an impression that strikes me when I look at this one. I've seen this one as well. I saw this one at the Art Gallery of Ontario some 25 years ago. It's, it seems as though you, the viewer, have been caught looking at her. And in that being caught, there's something about you that's not just being noticed, but, but genuinely being seen. Because, of course, the experience of looking at a painting is usually one of security. The painting doesn't generally look back at you. It doesn't make demands of you. But I wonder whether the lady's eyes here are making a demand. And now, once again, moving both forward and back, we come to Waterhouse's 1888 Lady of Shalott, capturing the lady at the moment when she leaves the island and begins her downriver journey toward Camelot. This is probably the most famous of the paintings of the Lady of Shalott. If you've ever seen one picture of this poem, it's probably been this picture. And as with a number of the other paintings that we've looked at, the, the painters are including details that are either different from the poem or not included in the poem at all. This, of course, is one of the difficulties of trying to render in a single visual image an artwork that itself unfolds over time, which paintings, of course, don't. So trying to encapsulate the essence of a narrative poem in a stationary picture is very challenging. We see here, for example, that she's brought the tapestry with her, and we know it's the tapestry, not just a tapestry, because it's unfinished. There, there's a, an unfinished bit in the lower right-hand corner. This detail doesn't occur in the poem, but the presence of the tapestry in the boat evokes the scene with the tapestry in her tower. And, of course, the poem makes no mention of candles, and yet there are three candles in the boat, two of them burned down and out, and one of them looking like it's on the verge of blowing out, a wonderful way of visually symbolizing her approaching death. A few slides ago as well, I mentioned images that catch her at a point of decision, particularly the point of decision to look out the window. This one catches her at another point of decision. You notice her right hand is holding the chain that keeps the boat moored to the island. This is just the moment when she lets go, probably the last decision she makes. Because from here, of course, she simply is taken by the current. There are no paddles in the boat, not in the poem, not in the picture. So the decision to willingly surrender herself to the current of the river and everything that that symbolizes is the decision that we catch right at this very moment. And once again, moving both forward and back, we come to 1878 and John Grimshaw's Lady of Shalott, which depicts the lady floating down the river toward Camelot, dead or dying, in a red sunset whose Tones almost evoke the color, or really do evoke the color, of sunset in a smoggy environment. That is, a London sunset. And I say this specifically because this scene is one that Grimshaw did the year before, but depicting not Tennyson's version of the story, but Mallory's, that is, the Lady Elaine drifting downriver, and in the background of that version is a cityscape, a city skyline which, while not necessarily London, certainly evokes London. So there's, there's a visual tension, I think, here between the, between the medieval and the modern. It's also, I think, worth noting that the light here is strange. And I mentioned in the last lecture that the Pre-Raphaelites did strange things with light. They didn't really worry too much about whether it was realistic. 
the light in the sky, the source of light in the sky does not match the lighting on the lady herself. This light is coming from two different sources. I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but she is simply lit differently. It's as almost as if she were being lit by stage lights, which of course didn't exist at the time, the light bulb still being several years in the future. But there is this sense that the light shining on the lady is of a qualitatively different sort than the light that is illuminating the clouds. There's, there's a clarity to it or a purity to it that the red and I do think sort of smog cluttered cloudscape doesn't have. Further on and further back still, the lady, now dead in her boat, arrives at Camelot in Arthur Hughes' 1872-73 Lady of Shalott. The thing I find particularly interesting about this scene, well, there are a few things, but one is the lighting. There's clearly a, a light side and a dark side to the canvas. The people are on the light side. They're dressed, of course, in typical peasant robes. One of them may have religious garb, I'm not exactly sure. To the right side, however, there are swans, one of which is foregrounded and brightly lit, and the others of which are in the background, in the shadows, including three signets. So there's a sense of, well, there's a sense of balance between the humans and the swans, isn't there? Because there are five of each, two adults and three young in both groups. So there's this weighing of the human and the unhuman, the human and the natural world against each other, with the human world being associated with that daylight and the, the non-human world from which the lady has just emerged, being associated with swans, some of the most beautiful birds in England, and, and shadow. Her arrival also sparks a crisis of interpretation, doesn't it? They don't know what to make of her. And how could they know what to make of her? They too, in a way, are, are sheltered. They don't know what's upriver any more than she knew what was downriver. But she brings something with her that disturbs them, even though she herself isn't there to see them disturbed. Just as Lancelot disturbed her into action, she disturbs, moves something in them. So there's this sense of, of a back and forth between the world of the court and the world upriver, the world that is closer to the wilderness, or in maybe a strictly romantic sense, the urban and the rural. In any case, there is, both in the poem and, the, in, and in the picture, as I said, something about her arrival, something about her presence that brings something, brings an impulse or a challenge to the court that it doesn't quite know how to respond to. And we'll see, as typically happens in Arthurian romance, when they respond, they don't necessarily respond correctly. They don't necessarily get what's happening. And now, finally, we come to the end of the lady's journey and ours. We reach Camelot, and we do so in 1857 through this wood carving done by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. This one shows Lancelot at the moment that he sees the lady floating into, uh, floating into Camelot and looks down on her and says, she has a lovely face. God in his mercy lend her grace. And I usually like Lancelot. Like he's one of my favorite characters in all of Arthurian literature, all of literature, quite frankly. He's, he's just wonderful. He's, he's a glorious mess. But in this moment, I kind of want to choke him. And I want to choke him because his, his response here, and this is, I know, is, is Tennyson's point, completely misses the lady's journey. He has no idea what he's caused. And yet here's this dead person lying in front of him because of him, because of what, what woke up in her on perceiving him. Lancelot in Arthurian literature, if you haven't encountered him before, he's basically eros incarnate he's also courtesy incarnate but within the limits or constrained by his particular love of, of queen guinevere he is the ultimate courtly lover actually the term courtly love was coined 
to describe his affair with Guinevere. But in this one, he, his response is, is pure convention, which to me is not Lancelot at all. But in so far as he's functioning in this poem as sort of a representative of, of Arthur's court, he's partly doing that, then it makes sense, of course. But what we also see here is, is the imposition of a reading on the lady that has really nothing to do with the lady once she reaches the place where the person who prompted her journey happens to be. And I wonder, as I'm just speaking right now, because I've never known quite to make of this, of this particular wood carving, I, I wonder whether this is simply another enclosure for her, whether that conventional God lend her grace throwaway comment, oh, she has a lovely face, she's pretty. So great, she's beautiful and let's wrap her in grace. whoopity do. I mean, it's not quite as obtuse as if he were to look at her and say, yeah, I'd hit that, but it's not far off. He's just a complete doofus here. And insofar as his response, though, is a purely conventional response, it does sort of re-enclose the lady, wrap her again in someone else's narrative. But maybe there's another way of looking at it, and that is her journey, maybe her journey down river and her journey from life into death has not so much been one of a, one of character progress, but a revelation that she is always and always has been wrapped in other people's narratives and that her situation in her tower and her situation in Camelot are different versions of the same situation. And that kind of, of re revealing rather than developing is actually consistent with much of medieval romance. That is, maybe the poem, both of the situations, both of the locations, the tower and Camelot are working together to say something about the situations in which Victorian women find themselves. And I guess this wraps up our little traipse through the, uh, the wonderful visual world of Lady of Shalott. There are many, many more renditions, pre-Raphaelite and other, of this wonderful poem out there, and... I would certainly encourage you to explore as many of them as you can, as I would encourage you to explore as much pre-Raphaelite art as you can. It's, it's an absolutely delightful visual world. The visual world, quite frankly, that given my preferences, I would probably choose to live in. For now, though, mortal life being what it is, it's time to move on. But where we're moving on to is a discussion of Goblin Market, which will be the subject of the next little talk. So a bit of an exploration of pre-Raphaelite literature, which will also continue after March break, because of course there is a pre-Raphaelite element, a very strong pre-Raphaelite element, to House of the Wolfings, which is the William Morris novel that we have on our syllabus. So if this general aesthetic appeals to you, we're not quite done with it yet. We are, though, done with this particular topic, so thank you very much for listening. Bye for now.